Thank you for the introduction. It's my honor to be here and appreciate uh, the uh, invitation to speak. Uh, typically, I speak to scientific audiences, so for me, it's sometimes a little challenge to sort of dumb down the information, quote unquote, to make it understandable and not get lost in too many details. So feel relaxed to raise your hand if I should repeat something. Yeah? Um, I would like to start with a thought about holistic versus reductionistic. Reductionism means that you reduce a problem to its smallest possible element, such as an atomic structure, and then um, understand the truth at its very depth. However, the idea of reductionism, which was originally proposed by René Descartes in the 17th century, he said you have to reduce problems to the most basic unit, and then go back to understand the whole. So reductionism is only a part of understanding a holistic view of whatever. Yeah. So I would argue that we need both, the reductionistic and the holistic view, how to put all these things back together again. Yeah. And the mechanic who works on the car, the spark plugs, he may say, well, I'm an electrician, I don't care about the rest of the car. And the car driver might say, well, I'm a car driver, I want the car to drive, but I don't care about the pressure in my uh, tires or the spark plugs, how they function. Yeah? Each of them is right in their own ways, but if you want to understand why the car drives, you have to have an understanding of the whole. And so, in a way, I take you today on a journey to understand some reductionistic details, which will perhaps better explain, also from a scientific, empirical point of view, what it means to have vision loss, what it means that stress has an influence on our eyes, and especially what can you do with additional scientific knowledge in order to help patients improve both their vision and also their mental state. So the topics I will cover relate to the issue of stress that Esther has just uh, introduced in the previous lecture, but also about modern approaches to alternate brain function and visual processing to improve vision. And as a scientist, especially with my training in psychology, I'm not coming from ophthalmology, I'm coming from the psychology and brain science side, um, I have the liberty to talk about holistic issues as well, and I'm not stuck with just some uh, reductionistic details. Now, as a matter of introduction, I want to just remind ourselves that vision is not only an issue of the eye, but it's most and foremost an issue of the brain. It's like the microphone. If my microphone, if that was the eye, if my microphone is not working, of course, I, you can't hear me. Yeah? But if we don't have a transmission and the amplifier and the team managing that, then what good is a good microphone if the rest of the system is not functioning? And the damage or the vision loss could have all kinds of different causes which are related to specific diseases, of course. Um, depending on where the damage is happening, for example, in the eye or in the optic nerve, you will have different kinds of vision loss, or if it progresses or happens in the brain, like in the visual pathway, sort of the information highway that sends the signals from the eye to the brain, so it's processed and then we have consciousness of vision or conscious vision, or in case of stroke, when the amplifier is destroyed, then even a healthy microphone won't work. So anywhere along this trajectory, vision can be impaired because of different kinds of mechanisms. And as you know, there are many different eye diseases, and I do not have to educate about them because you are all a specialized audience. Um, but if we 
keep in mind that about 20, almost 20% of all people um, above 65 may end up with some vision impairment. I think the scope of the problem is quite obvious. Now here I preaching to the converted, um, and um, but a, but a fundamental assumption, especially that we hear from um, eye doctors, is that when there is a vision loss, there is a part of vision that is blind, and then there may be some part that is seeing. So the vision um, performance, as judged by our concept, is either it's a healthy part or it's a dead part. Yeah? So if you see like a dark area in the visual field, as indicated in this image, according to the old concept, you have an intact area and you have a blind area. But what we are proposing is that vision cannot be judged as being either blind or seeing, but there are shades of gray. And you know that they are variable. And these shades of gray, they are the most interesting subject for us because these are areas that are partially functioning. And when it's partially functioning, the question comes, can you do something to improve the vision of partially functioning areas? Or you could even ask, is black really blind? Or is there some vision behind the black curtain? And how do we open the curtain to see what's behind it? So when I ask you, when do we go to the hospital? Do we go to the hospital when we are healthy? No. Do we go to the hospital when we are dead? No. We go to the hospital when we are sick. And what I am saying is, it's not an issue if there's blindness or no blindness. The issue is, what is the residual vision a given patient still has? And how can we manage to understand it and maybe even alter it? Here you see a diagram of a visual field that we test with compu spe special computer tests we have developed. And you can see that the visual field has these black areas, it has white areas and gray areas. And it's these gray areas which are medically our target, where some cells have survived, but other cells may not have survived the disease. Or some cells are active and other cells are inactive. We believe, based on the research done in the laboratory, and I have worked in this field for over 40 years, looking at mechanisms of vision loss and mechanisms of vision recovery, we believe that there are silent neurons. Neurons which, for some reason, do not function properly, they are hypometabolic, that means their metabolism isn't working right, not enough oxygen, not enough energy, and they can hang around there for years. Yeah? It's like a patient in the intensive care unit, they may survive very long, but they are not dead and neither are they healthy. So the challenge to find ways to improve vision is not to put new cells in there or regenerate the cells, make them grow out again, new connections. The challenge and our task is to activate inactive cells, wake up silent cells, which are in a kind of hibernation mode. They're too sick to function, but healthy enough to survive. So, one of the observations that triggered my research started with laboratory rats. Um, but also looking at some particular cases in the literature, one of which is Anton Rederscheid, who suffered stroke. He was a painter, and two months after stroke, he painted himself, looking in the mirror, what do I see in painting it? And you see at two months, you kind of can imagine half of the face and maybe parts of the shoulder, maybe the ear. And after five months, you see that the image of what he was seeing actually improved, so that to six months and to eight months, there was a significant recovery without any specific treatment. It was spontaneous recovery. The patient recovered spontaneously, but then reached a certain limit. So when we look at vision, we cannot focus on what's not there, 
we should study in detail what is still there. Where are the cells that are inactive? How can we help them to improve? And why are they inactive in the first place? Why don't they just continue functioning? Now, these silent neurons, they can be described by biological, physiological means. And I tried to give you sort of the simple version of it, that um, a neuron that sends signals, visual signals from the eye through the optic nerve to the brain, does that with an electric impulse, or I should say many, many electric impulses called action potentials. So a healthy neuron can fire when a visual stimulus hits the eye. And in order to fire, so for the machine in your Ferrari to work, you need to have the spark plug, the electricity to run the motor, but you also need gasoline. So the gas has to get to the car, to the motor, so that the spark plugs can make a little explosion so your motor starts running. And you have the exhaust, meaning that the, you know, the exhaust has to leave the motor, otherwise it will not work for you. What happens is that silent neurons exist because cells that are exposed to long-term stress hormone pollution will reduce or cease their function without necessarily dying. So we believe that the actual mechanism, the biological mechanism, why stress affects neuronal function is because of a lack of blood supply that is triggered by mental stress. Yeah. This is where the mind meets the biology, or where the biology meets the mind. It's intertwined, tightly intertwined. So it's the lack of sufficient blood flow, especially a problematic venous blood flow, that is the outgoing exhaust, if you will, from the motor, that is the problem with mental stress. And so what we believe is that if you stimulate surviving neurons by training, by electrical stimulation, which I will talk about briefly later, then maybe you can reduce the negative effects of long-term stress. Also, if you meditate, you give the system a chance to relax. We heard a lot about the effects of stress. We believe that the stress is actually one of the main causes of vision loss or one of the main causes of lack of recovery. So the idea is to normalize blood flow in order to reactivate sleeping cells. When I started my career in the neuroscience field, by training I'm a psychologist and a brain scientist, I was interested in the question of recovery from brain damage. This is what I did my PhD on in the United States. And I came to fall in love with the visual system when I moved to MIT, where I realized that the visual system is an excellent model to understand even also how brain functions can recover. So ever since that time, I'm stuck with the issue of vision. That sounds too negative, right? Stuck. I discovered the love for vision. <laughs> Let me put it this way. It's better. Um, and in this way, we were able to find out what some of these mechanisms are. Now, I'd like to start off my journey today with a story that started in India when I went um, to an Ayurveda retreat and um, meeting a very gifted Ayurveda uh, medical doctor. I asked him, Sundara, tell me, is there an indication in the old traditional Indian medicine, Ayurveda, that the stress has anything to do with eye diseases. So he says, oh, let me look at it. I come back to you next day. So he came back and he, he read an old book um, that had the teachings of three, about 3,000 years ago. And he says, yes, there is an indication that stress has something to do with vision loss. So he studied this book 
and found a passage written in Sanskrit, which he actually is able to read. He is a Sanskrit scholar as well, it's the old Indian, sort of the Latin of India. And this is what he found, a short passage of stress. Um, I, I do translate it for you here. Yeah? And he found that there are 18 causes of vision impairments, 18 causes why you can lose vision, six of which are mental. These are shown here in red. Poor sleeping habits like daytime sleeping, awakening at night, and so on. Continuous weeping, anger, grief, stress, suffering, pain, physical or mental exhaustion, and suppression of tears, meaning not being able to address your own emotional well-being. And this is 3,000 years ago. So that knowledge has long been lost, but I think through the work of many who in clinical practice see that stress and vision are somehow related, this knowledge is reawakening. And also it is getting more attention by the scientific community. Now, from a scientific point of view, um, it is the work of um, Joseph Flammer at, uh, in Basel, he used to be the chief of the eye clinic there, who discovered that patients with glaucoma, one particular type of disease, they have certain characteristics, bodily signs and symptoms. And I've listed them here, cold hand and cold feet, you easily freeze. Compulsiveness, yeah? that you're always stuck with your thought, it has to be exactly that way and it has to be perfect. Tension in neck and head region, lack of thirst, not drinking enough liquid, often associated with tinnitus, which is the sound in the ears, which can, in the most extreme case, can lead to, to hearing loss, migraine, and it typically happens with people who are quite tender, um, a slim body shape, or pale skin. Patients who have that are 70% women and 30% men. Okay, now don't worry, it's not like if you feel this now with you that you will get vision loss. There is actually probably some genetic disposition that makes you vulnerable to it. So based on the discussions Professor Flammer and I had, we came to the conclusion that it is caused not only by vascular dysregulation, which these symptoms actually represent, the lack of vascular supply, but it's the stress that leads to the vascular supply. Problem. So the sequence is stress, vascular dysregulation, lack of blood supply, too little oxygen, neurons, go to sleep. And that can happen over time, of course. Now, what are some of the psychological causes of stress? We heard some examples in the previous lecture. The ones that I find regularly in my patients, which is typical in 70, roughly 70% of our patients or even more, excessive stress in everyday life, ambitiousness, being perfectionist, meaning I'm only happy when I got the 100% and 95 is not enough, to worry a lot, sacrificing your own needs to help others. We call them the angels. Lack of self-confidence, lack of self-appreciation, feeling easily guilty about not fulfilling these expectations and afraid, being afraid to fail. 70% of our patients, I would say, and they are, not, they are both men and women, um, we call them the angels, angel personalities, where duty is always first. And the fun, you kind of have to feel guilty if, if you have fun. Mm -hmm. Being perfect and um, showing those characteristics. Now, in those patients, we argue that the angel is a someone that belongs to heaven and devil belongs to hell. But we are on earth. So 100% angel is not healthy. So what I tell my patients is think of it this way. If you are an angel, 
and you're always there for others, and you're always perfect, and everything has to always go your way. Why don't you just have some fun, take the little devil on your hand, yeah? So you're a big angel, take the little devil like a child. A little devil, you know, with the like teeth and with the horns, and uh, come, I show you the world. Yeah. It's an image that actually works well. A more extreme example, don't quote me on it, but as I say, you know that Jesus died on the cross. Yes, I know. Why? Hmm. Why? Hmm. Try to save the world of its sins. You say, right. That's why he died on the cross, and you do not have to repeat it. <laughs> that sticks. Yeah? We are on earth. So take the little devil, do things that have fun, enjoy life, relax, take care of yourself, all the goodies that are listed here, self concern be assertive. And, but there are also certain lifestyle factors that we consider to be critical. And one of the main ones for blood flow problems is not enough drinking. So we recommend our patients drink two liters every day, even if you're not thirsty. Put the bottles there in the morning, in the evening they have to be empty. And when you drink, drink a zip at a time, otherwise it doesn't get absorbed by the body. Exercising, healthy diet, regular bedtime, going to sleep around the same time. Yoga exercises, eye yoga. Avoid pressure of the eye against the pillow at night if you sleep on the side, because that means increased pressure may suffocate the blood vessels, because you're stepping on the hose in the garden, and if you're stepping with your foot on the hose, water is not flowing. Yeah, it's the same thing, so if you have pressure, external pressure, that's a, a, a bad thing. What works really very well is ginkgo. Ginkgo enhances blood flow, patients respond very positively, uh, the recommendation is two times 120 milligrams a day, but please consult your physician first, because if you take some other heart medications, that may not uh, be a friendly situation. We offer what's called a microstimulation therapy, and we also teach our patients in our practice meditation and eye yoga. When I went into the scientific field, it's been a few semesters um, in the past, uh, I was already convinced that meditation is good for your life. But I wasn't convinced that going into the science of meditation would be a good basis to become a scientist, because they all go, you're a crazy meditation, oh, what's that, you know? And it's funny, my first publication was on meditation, and now after 40 years I'm coming back, sort of full circle, back to meditation and understand how important it is, because I understand the scientific basis of relaxation and how it is effective in reducing stress and strain. So stress is induced to a large extent by poor communication from the doctors. doctors eye doctors don't have much time, they are not trained, they don't know it, but the fact is patients when they hear the story, you may go blind or take your drops, otherwise you could go blind. The patient will not remember the exact wording of the doctor, but they will have an emotional reaction, and that reaction says, I will go blind. The doctor may not have said it, some even say it. Huh? They may not have said it, but they feel, I will go blind. And if they are compulsive, they think about it a hundred times a day. It is a constant source of stress that is being released by the brain. Stress hormones are being released by the brain. And you continuously flood your vascular system with pollution, so to speak. The body and mind are not made for continuous stress. They are there for the fight and flight response. So if you meet the lion in the desert, you run away as fast as you can. So it gives you the energy. That's the function of stress. So it is one of the main sources. And stress can induce a vicious cycle. It starts with the stress event. I meet the lion. OK, we're not talking about lions. But let's say somebody got angry at me, or I was treated unfair, or my finances don't look good. So that is the triggering stressor, as they call it. How I react to it is a subjective matter. 
And that depends on my personality. How do I deal with stress? Am I resilient to stress? Can I handle it? Or do I think, oh, my life is shortly ending and I will be completely dependent on everyone and I'm going blind, I can't read and so on. So it's the emotional response that then leads to a biological reaction on the brain cells and on the retina cells. And by the way, the whole body, the whole psychosomatic medicine is working on the understanding that stress can reduce the function of our bodily organs, of all organs. So the cellular reaction is the release of stress hormones and as the result, dysregulated blood flow. This then can lead to pathology. Depending on your genes, on your genetic disposition or your genetic sensitivity, the stress can either affect your eye, your ear, your heart, your gastrointestinal system, or other organs. Now, which organ is damaged first may be genetic. If the eye leads to pathology, then you go to the eye doctor. You're already stressed out from your life experiences. Then the doctor says, hmm, I see some pale there in the center of your eye. It looks like your optic nerve is dead. Oh. I'm nervous that what am I going to do? What the doctor does not tell you is pale doesn't mean the nerve is dead. It means there's not enough blood flow because otherwise it would be pink. You see the little blood flowing. Yeah? So if you are then compulsive because of your personality, worry a lot and only love the world when it's perfect, then you have a problem because now you go home with a message I will go blind. This then creates additional stress. What does the stress do? It affects the biology, it improves, it, it reduces vision even further. Then you get, oh, my doctor was right, I'm going blind, oh, I'm going blind. So you have more reasons to be worried and so on. So it's kind of a downward spiral. So the way to get out of it is to come upward again. Try to deal with the stress or find ways of improving your blood circulation. So it's both the patient's personality and stress history or traumatic experiences, plus the doctor's communication, or either one alone. Now, what to do about that? Is stress perhaps a cause of vision loss, or is it the consequence of vision loss? So in one study that I have done together with a group in India, in New Delhi at the uh, India All Institute of Medical Sciences, is we studied meditation. Here I am circling back to where my science started, like something 30, 40 years later. We studied meditation in a group of glaucoma patients. And if you, see, if you take a look at the upper IOP, the intraocular pressure, you see that the pressure, which is too high in glaucoma, actually is reduced by four weeks of meditation. Whereas in a control group that didn't do the meditation, the pressure stayed the same. There are about 150 papers in the literature. We once did a complete analysis of the world literature that indicates that stress has to do with vision loss. And there are also indications that it could be the cause. So when a meditation is practiced, and in this way, patients learn to relax in this non-specific way, it normalizes eye pressure. But when you measure then, for instance, I call it the happiness factors. These are biochemical molecules in the body that are good for you, such as the beta endorphins. They give you the sort of the happiness feelings, kind of the, the, the happiness hormone. Or others, um, like some trophic factors, they improve after four weeks of meditation. Stress markers, such as cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone, is declining and also the bad immunological markers, like interleukin-6 and others, are declining. And when we look at life quality that the patients report subjectively, 
we find that the meditation significantly improves the quality of life. So that being said, it demonstrates that relaxation can have a biologically meaningful and healthy effect on the brain and the whole body. Now let's talk a minute about the brain. Vision is more than just the eye. It's the eye and the brain working together in combination with the blood supply, the vascular system. So it's this triangular relationship that Professor Flammer and I described as the underlying cause of vision loss is a dysfunction in some element of this triangle. It could be the retina in the eye, it could be the brain, and it could be the vascular system. And I'm not going through all the details how the brain and the eye interact or how the brain and the vascular system interact, or the vascular system and the eye. You see the relationship is um, sort of in both directions for each of those. So the situation is quite complicated in that there are many, many influences with a collaboration between the eye, the brain, and the blood supply can be interrupted. That's the problem. That's holistic. It's not one molecule. It's the whole organ view, the whole body view. Now, that shouldn't be all so surprising because of the brain's role in visual processing. The retina is basically in charge of visual sensation. That is the upper part of this graph. To process the stimulus, is it bright enough to see, is it big enough to see, is it, is it presented long enough, and so on. This is all present, processed by the retina, and the retina does some bit of pre-processing and sort of packaging the information and send it to the brain, and then the brain has to make sense out of it. And there are many different influences that govern whether or not you're able to see properly. The brain physiological state. If we have normal brains, then you know, it's fine. But if there is damage, for example, after a stroke, we may have a problem interpreting the image. Focal attention, focusing on one thing. Yeah. The rabbit sitting in front of the, you know, of the serpent. Global attention, paying in general attention, fatigue, acute stress, emotions have a great influence on vision. In fact, they have a much greater influence than scientists have appreciated. The expectation that something will happen makes a huge difference whether you pay attention or not. If you expect somebody to come out of that little road from the right and you know they have the right of way and you're already expecting something, you react faster than if you're thinking of whatever else. Yeah? So it makes a difference if you see it on time or not. The time of day has even influenced it, even the weather. Atmospheric pressure. Yeah. And then there are chronic influences, like the perception, perceptual learning, chronic stress, and also brain networks that are influenced or influence visual perception, as well as visual memory. So the brain is a complicated machine with 100 billion neurons that process information. And what really needs to be done is that this information needs to be synchronized because the, the retina only has 1.2 grams of nervous tissue processing vision, whereas the brain has several hundred grams that processes vision. That alone, that alone should teach us that we cannot ignore the brain. So information first travels to the back of the brain and then it's processed with different mechanisms throughout the brain. So basically the whole brain is more or less in one place or another involved in visual processing. And now it becomes a little scientific, but I hope that you can appreciate why I talk about brain synchronization. Because a brain wave, and we process our information with brain waves, if it's desynchronized, that is when one wave goes up while the other is down at the same time, the sum is zero. Yeah? 
So you may have two sorts, but they cancel each other out and zero. But if the sorts are in synchrony, like the waltz, or the dancing, if they're in synchrony, then you see some beautiful result that is the thought or the consciousness. So the same energy, but synchronized different, uh, more properly, is another influence on vision. So that we look at the retina, the brain, and our conscious perception, which is illustrated by these images on the left, we can think of it that the retina with a single wave will be ignored by the brain that is basically too complicated, too desynchronized to process this information. However, if you get the brain waves to synchronize in the proper way, by the way, collected with the EEG, electroencephalography, if they are synchronized, then the same signal that comes to the retina, even if it's a small signal, is understood by the brain, and the brain goes, aha, this was a dot, or this was a bicycle driver coming from the right. So the same visual information is then processed or not processed, depending on the synchronization state of the brain. It's like a group of people standing around, and everybody chatters you know, randomly, and you try to listen to it, it makes all no sense. But if they all sing together, yeah? or if you clap your hands, if you clap your hands randomly, then I say, oh, thank you, thank you, and so on. But if you all go at the same time, then that buys me some extra time to lengthen my lecture because it means encore. Yeah? It's the same activity, but it's the, the timing. It's the timing that, pro that makes the difference whether I shut up or I continue. Yeah? So a new way that we have designed to improve synchrony in the brain is with neuromodulation using microcurrents. And we have most recently developed and just got CE approval for the stimulator that allows the electricity to be stimulate to the electricity to be delivered to electrodes which are positioned near the eyes, as shown in the picture up on the right. And what it does, it gives pulses in certain frequencies, so to enhance a desynchronized brain to become more synchronized again. So kind of move the brain with the vision loss to one where the vision actually gets better. The result of that I will now share with you. Ten days of treatment for about an hour um, aims at delivering the current not only to the eye, but also to the frontal cortex, which is also important for vision, not just the occipital cortex in the back. And this kind of stimulation then can improve network activity of the human brain, of patients. You see where it says normal, that's a subject without vision loss, and the person who has had uh, damage to the optic nerve loses this information highway from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. So here, th this is the connection from the back to the front and normals, this information highway is lost. However, after 10 days of therapy, that one is in part restored. So you can actually push the brain to be synchronized better again. At the same time, we see that there is an improvement in blood supply, which, just take a look at this area here, RO1-2, um, RO, um, uh, compared to after therapy, you see there is less blood flow before the therapy and more blood flow in the brain after the therapy. Now, what we have accomplished this way is we have triggered the blood supply to become normalized again. So neurons wake up and start firing again, being reactivated. Now, that may all sound very theoretical to you, and you want to go home and say, so what good is it for my patients? What can I tell them? Here is what you can tell them. And this is shown by a short video. If we can have the video, please, then uh, we can take a look at the story there briefly. Okay, we're going to start now. Here we go.
This is one of the most anxiety provoking exercises a person can do. This machine, it's called a Humphrey, randomly blinks tiny lights and I'm to click when I see one. The ones I miss measure my vision loss. All those numbers there that you see that are zeros are blind spots. He doesn't see those areas. You see, I have glaucoma, and I've been clicking for almost 20 years. You can see how the disease is robbing me of my sight. That was my vision a few years ago, when I first started making the film Going Blind. Since then, it has gotten worse. My vision often looks like it's seen through dirty glasses. Oncoming traffic at night gives me a blinding glare. My ability to read with my left eye is especially impaired. Not as sharp, right? This is the oven, not as, not as sharp, but it's not sharp. Well, I mean, not maybe, crisp, but that's, Yeah, maybe it's just not just, there. That's just the way it's probably going to be. In the United States, some treatments can slow or stop vision loss from optic nerve damage, but none can reverse it. However, I heard of a study in Magdeburg, a medieval German town about two hours from Berlin, where researchers are making strides in actually reversing vision loss. I decided to give it a try. We have about 15 people here in the research group um, of different disciplines, uh, and all of them uh, focus more or less on the issue of uh, uh, restoring vision. We have most recently started work on non-invasive brain stimulation. The work is based on 20 years of research done on thousands of patients at the Human Brain Institute in St. Petersburg, Russia. This is the concept. The optic nerve brings the data the eye senses to the brain, and the brain interprets that data as sight. But an optic nerve damaged by glaucoma brings less data back to the brain. With electric brain stimulation, the hope is to improve the brain's ability to interpret the data coming in through the damaged optic nerve. When I first arrived, we spent two days evaluating my vision so we could compare results before and after. This included visual fields, as well as EEGs, to measure brain waves. My visual fields show what vision I have left. The white is good, the black is gone, and the various shades of gray indicate what is called residual vision. It's these areas of partial function where we vision is neither absent nor normal that are the, that give us an opportunity for uh, restoration and repair. We got your data, mm -hmm. and now uh, we have some conclusion about it. Uh -huh. Our left eye still um, a central area seems to be uh, clear, but surroundings much worse. Mm -hmm. But still, we have some kind of gray dots. Mm -hmm. It means probably it's the islands will respond to the treatment first. The treatment is the administration of alternating current. First, four electrodes are attached around my eyes. The current goes through my eye and optic nerve and into my brain. I detect a sense of movement. Then I see what appears to be light. This is called a phosphine effect. As the current increases, so does the clarity of the light. Okay, you're good. Then he adjusts the frequency. The light starts to flicker, and he increases the frequency until the flickering stops. And then we're ready to go. For 20 to 40 minutes each day, the current is introduced to each electrode in a figure eight pattern. And that's it. It's about half of the patients who benefit from the therapy. Um, and some uh, that profit have marginal or less pronounced improvements, but there are others who have massive improvements. Two 
two weeks later, more evaluations, visual fields and EEGs. And then I find out which sort I'll be. Die Mutter der Marmalade ist die Quitte. Sie gab dem Protostrisch um, ihren Namen Portugiesisch Marmalade. What does that mean? <laughs> it means you can read. <laughs> That's pretty good. Even though I don't know what I'm saying, I can read it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I would like to conclude that uh, we got from uh, your side uh, during your examination good results because not only you could read better and mm -hmm. see better, but also your visual field now looks uh, better and uh, it's significant. And here is your visual field chats, especially for the, your left eye. Mm -hmm. And before the therapy, you see mostly we have this central, uh, this cartoma near your center, which affect to your central vision also. And after 10, uh, ten sessions, mm -hmm. brain stimulation, mm. uh, if you're looking for the central area, we see that uh, centrally uh, your visual field starts more clear. I exactly this defect area plus this area also can be explained in terms of improvement mm -hmm. because it practically seems to be like intact area. These changes uh, help you to start to read again. I'm happy to look at small changes. <laughs> these are these are more than small. Wow. And there are other improvements. The smudginess of my vision has been corrected. When I check my glasses to see if they are dirty, they really are. Glare has been greatly diminished, especially from oncoming traffic and in airports. And my acuity has improved in both eyes. I still don't like my deficit. But um, I think exploring a new avenue um, has energized me and uh, made me feel more optimistic about the different directions that people could go in research and the different ways that could be looked at in terms of uh, attacking some of these issues uh, of blindness. I think there's a lot of resignation in, uh, in ophthalmology mm -hmm. and um, that's not a good thing. Now it's time to change our thinking about how to um, treat brain functions. We should take advantage of the tremendous plasticity that the brain has. That's why it's great to get together with other collaborating research institutions to work together to shape the future of neurological treatment and therapy. And by doing so, we'll have new options available that never was thought of before and that will give us an advantage of helping many, many patients in the years to come. Okay, thank you for the video. If we can please... Here is the visual field of the patient. Pay attention to any one of those red circles. Uh, hold on. Before therapy, after. I flip back and forth, you see that there is a, some change. Yeah? Yeah? Here's another patient, glaucoma patient. Before therapy, 19%. After therapy, 63%. And we think that behind the black curtain of blindness, there is a, some potential of sleepy, silent cells that can be woken up by this kind of procedure. Here's another patient. He's our star patient, a young man. You see him here in the middle uh, between my two uh, the technicians. Um, he was a victim of an um, Islamist attack in Munich some years ago. And um, he went home in the evening after partying at 2 o'clock at night and three guys were walking some distance behind him and they screamed at him, hey, are you a Nazi? And then he turned around and said, I'm not a Nazi, I'm a Jew. That was not a good idea because they almost killed him with a baseball bat and he ended up with major neurological damage, one of which was vision loss. When he came to us, very positive attitude. Oh, professor, let's just try. And if it doesn't work, doesn't matter. I just want to see whether it try, whether it works or not. So after the therapy, he had some improvement to 15%, starting from 10. Then we gave him all kinds of exercises. 
meditation, relaxed serenity, this, that, and the other thing, so that he could, you know, look, have, have a more positive outlook. And when he came back four months later, he had a visual field of 73%. Now, if you see these examples, and then you think back of the prediction, you will go blind. It's actually not true. The potential is there to get much more vision out of patients with the appropriate procedure. This is just one example. And visual fields are, in fact, partly reversible. Meantime, we have treated over 1,000 patients that come to us from all over the world. And on the upper right-hand side, you see that there's a tremendous variability in response. By now, with different methods we have introduced since the video was made, we achieve about 80% of the patients to improve. And the improvement varies a lot between patients. There are some that do not improve, which are the dots on the red line here. This is age, is shown on the left. So age has no influence on recovery. Um, also, um, agenda has no influence on recovery, um, but it is still quite variable. And to um, understand this variability, and now we're coming back to the issue of stress, we find that patients who recover the best have a certain personality disposition. The ones with good recovery potential are open-minded, they are reliable, they are not sloppy, they are extroverted, cooperative, and emotionally stable. Those who recover less are not open, impulsive, introverted, not cooperative, they always have emotional issues to deal with, anxious, compulsive, worrisome, and so on. And through psychotherapy, we help some of them to change their state of mind, it is possible within two hours to achieve that with the right information for them. And then they also have a chance to improve recovery. So our therapy, which is being uh, practiced at my um, outpatient clinic in Magdeburg, um, which we call Zavir, um, uh, the Zavir is a holistic therapy because we not only use the microstimulation to improve blood flow and synchronizing brain activity, but we also use uh, different techniques such as meditation and eye yoga, and all with the goal to improve blood flow and therefore visual fields. So when I set out my career and I wanted to know why does the neuronal system recover? Today my understanding is it's not neuronal, you are all on the wrong track. In reality, it's vascular. It's the vascular system and specifically the veins that are the problem, less so the arteries. And it's the vein musculature which re reacts to stress in the most, you know, harmful manner. And so relaxation, that's our current hypothesis, relaxes the muscles of the venous vascular system, therefore increases blood flow, improving the delivery of oxygen and therefore neuronal activity. With that, I would like to end by saying vision loss is a holistic matter, also from the reductionistic point of view of different medical disciplines having to work together. We need ophthalmology, obviously, and neurology to understand the brain. We need neuroscience to understand the neuronal basis of vascular and neuronal activity, pharmacology to treat the diseases, and cardiology, and last but not least, psychology, which is my discipline, and all of them have to interact to understand the concept that vision loss is a holistic matter, and if somebody refuses that, they just don't want to learn, because it's all right there in the literature. And with that, I'd like to end my lecture by thanking my team, both at the university, which is the upper picture, and my clinical team in the clinic, and uh, I would like to draw attention to a book that's available in German and in English, Restoring Low Vision, which is a patient handbook and also good for clinicians that want to have some background of this whole brain story um, and um, a sort of read up of these things. Um, thanks for inviting me to this lecture. This was a wonderful gathering of reductionists and holists, or those of us who are both, like me, I can decide which area I want to choose. Today I do this, the next day I do something else. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.
Just one last comment. There's a little flyer out on the table, so for you to remember. Yes, there was a question. We. Oui. Uh, thank you. Do you treat uh, RP as well? Yeah, yeah, we treat RP. As, what we find, it doesn't matter what the ophthalmological disease is. Most of them will respond because the underlying mechanism is stress. So if there is a fundamental mechanism of stress and vascular problems, it is there in all different types of diseases. The best effects we have on um, uh, macular degeneration, uh, glaucoma, and also RP. And what happens most often is that fogginess goes away because fogginess is a lack of blood regulation. Yeah, there's a question. I have a question about meditation because I, I was uh, at a congress one year ago, I think, of physiotherapists in Strasbourg, and the doctor uh, made a presentation about the, the use of meditation and physical exercise for cancer. That was not I, but cancer. And she said, uh, strangely enough, that uh, when the people, mostly women, uh, did meditation, a meditation program at the hospital. Uh, so it was with a doctor and, you know, people guiding them. It had uh, good effects, but then when we looked at the, um, at the results, when the women had to do this at home, then the, the results were uh, disappeared of meditation, of the impact of meditation at home. And we, were, we wondered why. She said she had no explanation, but maybe it was because they were, I don't know, they had uh, to look after the house, and so meditation would just uh, more weight on their agenda. I don't know. But it, it was just a you know, comment about that. Maybe you noticed these things. I thought also may, it may have been... The, um, the advantage in hospital to be guided and to be surrounded and supported, uh, whereas at home they were alone to do this. I don't know, yes. the psychological impact of this. Concerning meditation and cancer, um, just the following comment. There was a recent paper in a top scientific journal called Nature that you may have heard about, and they showed that adrenaline actually changes the genetic expression of cancer cells. So there is, in fact, a causal link between relaxation, stress, and cancer. That's first. The second is, yes, if she did the meditation in the hospital in some sort of protected sort of cloud, yeah, is more effective than if you do it uh, at home because you are in an environment where you associate stress, tension, and burden, whatever. We have patients normally that come to Magdeburg, and we recommend them to stay for 10 days in Magdeburg, no matter where they live. And if they come from Berlin and they travel every day back and forth, we tell them you won't pr profit. And the answer is simple. We're trying to expand the blood vasculature. And then they go traveling back and forth and they're in their sort of stressful environment and then constrict the blood vessels again. Yeah, then you do the opposite of what you're supposed to do and that could explain it. Yes, I agree. Wow, Bernard, thank you. That, that was fantastic. I, I have several questions and I may... I'll check with you later, but one question is when you use that stimulator, um, the, you attach those things around the eyes and the person sees the flickering light, which then is adjusted the frequency until they see a steady light. Is the frequency that creates the steady light different per person or is it always the same? Well, we always adjust it for each individual patient. It's not always the same because patients react quite differently. Yes. Right. So you need that feedback, right? Right, exactly. So, so, so the, the light, the, the way they see the light is the feedback that you use. Now, is the stimulator stimulating the blood flow or the electrical signal through the optic nerve or both? It's actually both. I call it a double punch effect. Ah. Because neurons, they communicate with each other how? With electric signals called action potentials. These are electric signals, right? How does the blood vessel know to open up when a neuron becomes active? Yeah? It's electric signal too. It's an ion flow that comes from the activity of the neuron that the blood vessel kind of feels. I give you the sort of the general idea. Yeah? It can be molecularly explained, but it would be beyond the lecture. 
So we force the neurons to fire, and at the same time, we step on the gas pedal, so that only, not only the motor runs, but now the gas is also coming. You need to do both at the same time, and I think that's the trick. But if the patients are not relaxed, it's like they are closing up the exhaust. And then it's not helping you that the motor runs, and it's not helping that the gas comes there, because if the exhaust is stuck, the motor will stop. Yeah, so it's double punch, and that's the trick. Yeah. Yes? Est-ce que en France, certaines personnes font votre travail avec ce simulateur? Are some people doing your work in France uh, using this electrical system? Yeah. Are in France? And are some people applying your approach using an electric stimulator? Not yet. But in the US, yes. New York University, l'Université de Stanford, ils sont en train de... ...device, and the way we are moving in the future is by digitally treating patients with electrical stimulation. Through the internet, we can adjust the parameters and we can teach them the relaxation method. So our future of the development is actually a digital program uh, that only requires one or two days of visiting the clinic. Yeah. Um, oui, uh, une personne qui... Somebody uh, with a, a retinal problem, can I uh, tell them to contact you? over the world and also from France yeah, and from other countries. Optic nerve damage, glaucoma, macular degeneration, RP, unexplained vision loss is most of the time stress. Yeah. Stroke, traumatic brain injury. Cataract? With, hmm? cataract? cataract not, no. We're not dealing with cataracts and the anterior eye segment. Yeah. We start at the retina and the blood flow. And I don't want to yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. But actually, maybe one side note, which was quite puzzling to me. We had a patient who had problems walking in addition to the visual. He improved not only vision, but also the walking. The reason is because the current flows throughout the brain, and then other blood vessels outside the visual system also benefit from the therapy. But this is something we're not advertising because then we go, we're pushed in the esoteric corner and that I want to avoid by all means, as you probably can understand. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, there is one more. Hello, uh, two questions. First one regarding genetic um, effect on eye trouble, have you worked on that? And my second question is, uh, perhaps my translation won't be good, but I do it. Um, when someone believe unconsciously um, that uh, the persons continue and uh, uh, eye disease or eye trouble, but unconsciously, it's like a, a transfer of generational problem. Have you worked on that? It's clear ah, for you? Yeah. <laughs> no, I understood. So let me repeat the question so I'm sure that I understood it and everybody else does. So do we work with genetic issues? The answer is, that's the first question. The answer is, we're not working with genetic issues because I don't consider a genetic disposition to be necessarily phenomenological, meaning effective. A genetic disposition has no automatism that you will have a problem. You may have a sensitivity because of genetic some whatever it is. Yeah? You may have a sensitivity. But whether an actual pathology will develop out of it is a matter of all the other factors as well. It's a new field called uh, epigenetics. What regulates the genetic reading code? Yeah? Now, um, if a person has a familial background and you think, oh, it's genetic because the mother had it and the uncle or the grandfather had it or something, right? Then I say, well, it could also be educational, because if your grandfather was compulsive, then your mother ended up being compulsive, and what are you? Oh, I'm also compulsive. And so if you have the personality, 
because of a certain educational style that you have experienced, which is handed down from generation to generation, you may have a problem that is not genetic, but that may sound genetic, but it isn't. There's a famous experiment with mice. They stressed a mouse mother that was pregnant a lot, and when the babies were born, they ch checked how much were the babies affected by the stress, and they were all affected by the stress and in the generation after that, and in the generation after that. So for four generations, the stress was transmitted from the stressed out mother to the fourth generation of the offspring. Yeah. Sorry, I think it's the end. C'est fini? Do we have time? Uh, well, maybe there are two more questions, then we can close. Okay, three quick questions. Okay, I try to keep the answer short. But I'm a teacher, so forgive me. <laughs> I want to ask about the long-term uh, what Stability. Effectiveness, effectiveness of this uh, process. Yeah, we have done a multi-center clinical trial and measured two months later, and two months later it's still stable. It's actually better after two months than immediately after the 10 days. It's like a fertilizer. You put it on the grass and you don't see next day the grass already being like big. You just have to take some patience. So the effect of the electrical stimulation plus the teaching of the psychological thing, the meditation and so on, it all takes about six to eight weeks for the improvement to be maintained. However, there are patients who do not maintain what they have learned. What would you guess what they are like? Stress. The patient, okay, no, I can't talk about this particular patient, but I, um, another patient, he came to us several times. Each time he improved, then he went back. And I said to her, you have to calm down. You do have to change your thinking, your lifestyle. Yeah? Oh, no, no, but I am so busy, I do this. Time. In the end, she was operated so often by the doctor that the person ended up blind on one eye. Yeah? Those are the ones who do not benefit in the long term. Yeah. Yes? Uh, is there any time limit uh, after a stroke or injury uh, until you can treat successfully? Uh, no, it's, there is no particular time. It can be many years, it can be a few months. We usually stay away from the very early time when there is like intensive care issues or the spontaneous recovery, we wait for that because that is a time of a lot of stress. So the reason a stroke patient has a huge deficit is because a part of the brain is damaged. Yes, that's part of it. The other part is the huge stress around an accident, which can then suppress blood flow in the area surrounding the lesion. That's where it can recover. Yeah, yeah last question. Um, since we know that we relax the most uh, when our mind is interested, I wonder, would it be possible to use the, the equipment that you showed uh, in the movie to mm, project a movie uh, for the patient in, in a way that mm, the light impulses from the movie conduct the attention in a way that is relaxing for the retina and uh, the, that the light is hitting the right spots uh, you know what I mean? Yes, I know what you mean. Actually, it's not working. We did an experiment once where we stimulated with visual stimuli, not with movie watching, so visual stimuli and stimulation at the same time. No effect. Why? Because the visual stimulus is slightly delayed and in introduces a variation in the processing time. Whereas the electrical stimulation, they all fire exactly on the right millisecond. Whereas the retinal layers of the different nervous tissues, they have to do some processing. So now you're interfering one synchronization with the other. As this is, you're dancing and both dance a dif different style. Then you step on each other's feet. So you have to close the eyes and leave it alone. Don't think about it. No effort of the eyes. Yeah, that is a good Bates principle. Don't stress your eye. Don't pressure your eyes. Yeah? And let the electricity or the meditation take, take in its effect. Don't think about it too much. Just do it like brushing teeth. Okay. Are we done? Okay. <laughs>